Welcome to episode 27 of No Putts Given. On today's show, we've got nine, count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine Callaway drivers, Tony, is that right? We've got old school versus new school media, a big Twitter fight. And uh, we've got the new all the brands in the 2019 Most Wanted Driver Test. You're going to want to listen up. It's the first, I think, ever at Mike Off Spy. And we've got a stability tour putter shaft that costs way too much money. But you, you know, might need it. You might need it, I guess. And we're going to talk our favorite products of 2019 uh, from my golf spy staff. Let's get it. No Putts Given is powered by my golf spy, the most extensive reviews in golf. Before you buy, my golf spy. Nine million readers do it every year. Check us out. Let me go around the room and welcome uh, everybody to a couple who's on the show today. We've got the All-American, Harry Nodwell. <laughs> We've got, uh, who is Director of Products Testing in the Facility for Soft Goods. We've got our editor, Tony Covey. We've got writer, Chris Nickel, and just extraordinaire, uh, Mr. Nickel, and myself, Adam Beach is the owner. And uh, anyway, we're going to start the show today with an old school versus new school media fight in the golf media space on Twitter. It got uh, ugly fast and between Barstool and, you know, ESPN and some other writers and it was around exclusives and, uh, you know, somebody dapping up Tiger Woods and somebody saying, act like you've been there before. And anyway, it kind of is an interesting topic, I think, especially from a My Golf Spy standpoint. When we first started out, we were, I wouldn't say I would go as far as barstool sports, right? Uh, but we were definitely kind of the, the, the ugly stepchild in the family of golf media space. And I would say people tried to blackball us. I can say that pretty much as a fact. Heard from multiple people when we tried to get credentials for the PJ Tour media events that uh, they were not happy about that. And they let everyone on the tour know that they didn't want us out there. When we wrote articles, people weren't happy about those. I'm sure Tony remembers a few of those. And, you know, from all kinds of angles, from behind the scenes, people were trying to shut us up, tune us out, shut us down, whatever you want to call it, right? Just get the, us the hell out of the industry. So I can understand where Barstool's kind of coming from, and I can also understand where the other side is coming from. So Tony, kind of, why do you think this, why do you think we are where we are when it comes to this fight? I mean, take away the actual incident, but how this came to a head, really, and why? I mean, I think it, it's probably a, a generational thing, right? There's old school, literal textbook journalism, right? You're sort of away from the story, right? You kind of step back, and whereas if you kind of look at what started this, or or part of it with Barstool, right? A fist bump, and some of that kind of thing where you're... You're not just, I wouldn't say necessarily part of the story, but you sort of acknowledge that, hey, you know, I'm here and, and God forbid I enjoy it and I have a good time, right? I think that what I get to do is cool and I'm going to show that off and, you know, I want people to experience what it's like more than just kind of, hey, this is what happened. So I, I think there's still a lot of that conflict and, you know, some, some back and forth about what's the right thing, to, the right way to do things and who had an exclusive and who got what first and, and things like that, so... I think to go back to kind of a conversation you and I had, the reason kind of my golf spy exists to some degree is because golf digest old school media, right? Kind of didn't evolve, right? Which offered us an opportunity to come in and offer something that the consumer was telling us they wanted and they were not getting. And there's, I think a little bit of the same thing going on when it comes to the media uh, fight that we saw, right? So Barstool is, is had these old school medias. If you want to know why Barstool exists, look no further than your own mirror, uh, mirror old right. school media. Like look at yourself in the mirror because you created this monster by allowing these people, giving them the opportunity to create something and give something to the consumer that they've been wanting and you never gave them. So I understand the journalistic standpoint. I understand the old school media, but it does not mean you can't have both. And like I said, uh, old school media created this monster, right? Well, I think I think old school media is done. I think it's nah. I think well, think about it. You're catering to both parties. Like the older media caters to that person that still wants to read a paper, read a magazine, whatever it is, right? The new media is you. Do, you get content in so many different ways now. 
Tony, I know you remember when the, we heard about some old school media guys being told that they had to tweet like four times a day. I that's mean, right. that's real. And these dudes were like, uh, I can't believe I have to tweet. Well, that offered up an opportunity for the Barstool Sports of the world right. to go, you don't want to mess with this media over here? All right, but who's, who's, no. who's read a newspaper recently? But that's my point. Older people. You still have old school journalists, if you want to call them that, right? Producing content for online outlets. It's fundamentally, like I said, it's, it's a generational thing. It's a perspective thing. It's a different way of doing things. And yeah, I think, I think there are some basic rules that everybody should follow. And, and this is always, you know, in a world that moves like this, it's, it's tough to quantify this. But if, if somebody legitimately has a story first and, and you sort of report on that, yeah, you, you should give credit to the outlet that had it first. I, I think that's, that's a fundamental truth. But, but ultimately, if, if somebody is providing a type of content or, or delivering it in a way that you don't like, I don't know. I, I don't think that's, if you don't want to move into that space, don't, don't get angry because somebody else did period. Isn't part of the reality too, that as long as we have institutions or we're always going to have things that are anti that institution. Talking and, about like Elvis. Well, yeah, heck yeah. I mean, that's right. Isn't that part of the dynamic? Like I was thinking about this in, in the context of back to last week's topics with like Patrick Reed a little bit that part of what me <laughs> Tony I'm sorry did, did somebody hit you with a shovel um, <laughs> you know we want to have heroes but heroes aren't as fun unless there's like an enemy right with this good versus evil blah 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 I say all that to say basically that like the bar stool a little bit is that anti-establishment role right now and um, I think any healthy industry progresses in that way right there has to be it's what Star Wars and every movie is built on right Right, it's it's a formula, and so really, Barstool needs the old media, and old media uh, really needs something to be contrast to that. I totally agree. I mean, think about like my gospel, right? Like, there was these people around that were thankful that we were giving them something Golf Digest wasn't, right? But imagine if Golf Digest didn't exist. There's none of those people that are going, "Hey, we need something like this," right? My gospel is just something kind of boring at that point, but we offered an alternative that they raved about, and that's why we grew so fast. But if there wasn't that other side, do we still exist, right? That's right. Yeah, no, absolutely. These, these, you know, again, old school, right? It's probably not not completely fair, but but those guys, whether it's it's Golf Digest or the guys at ESPN and some of the Golf Channel guys, right? Those guys set the bar, right? They they drew that line in the sand. They set that bar, and then so that that created the opportunity for for people like us, like Barstool and all the other kind of new media types to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to go over this bar. I'm going to go around this bar, whatever it is. Right. But, but yeah, the old school guys, they set the standard, but the world has kind of changed and evolved since then. And we have to accept new standards. Do you think there's more new, not new school media outlets out there that's going to swamp and engulf the old school every the day there's a new one coming so out so that, that's what i'm saying do you the think the old school is ever is, is gonna disappear yeah but think about it it's always been like this from the beginning of time it's gonna evolve exactly so guess what 20 years from now guess what's gonna be old barstool or us and us or well, definitely. <laughs> me and tony are already there yeah, so a cortisone shot today man i'm <laughs> yeah so um you know and i do think that tony made a good point it's not shitting on Golf Digest. When they set that bar, back then there was no bar stool. They were the best of the best for a very long time, right? And they did a good job. They were good writers. There were good, all kinds of things they were putting out. It's just they waited too long, right? So I mean, now they're stuck. And that's the they're dinosaurs. Right. Yeah, by definition, they had the chance to. You can't evolve after the party. You know, they're, they're already late, you know, ship sailed, whatever metaphor you want to throw in there it's i think it would be too forced and contrived at this point to do that it would come off as you know unauthentic and then you really start to lose identity it's like okay now you're golf digest trying to be barstool like what is that and that's tricky too right because and and this is a battle adam and i fight all the time when we look at where does my golf spy evolve to right where are we going you have an established identity right and so once you are built on that identity and you, you, you have your place in your part of the world because of that identity, it's, it's not only difficult, in, in some ways it's dangerous to try and become something well, else. Well, think about artists, right? Like Rolling Stones or whoever you want to use as your example. There's artists that had a particular sound and never evolved, right? And then there's ones that 
over the decades can still, you know, like the Beatles, right? You can listen to that still today. Well, that's like, that's relevant though. From it, some of the songs that they produced back then is still relevant to today. That's, it's hard to stay relevant. Now that being said, the latest information that we got from a source that tells you who is the most trusted sources of media, and guess who's close to the top still? Golf Digest. We talk about this, right? Good stories will always be relevant and that means good storytellers will always be relevant and you know if you want to talk again the old school guys that is the strength of of that way of doing things right you have absolutely phenomenal storytellers in that space and so i think as as long as good stories matter and i hope that's always going to be the case they'll have a place right that's you know but it, again we're in a 5 minute world now right it's you know fist bump and on to the next thing no one's going to Barstool for a great story. They're going there for entertainment and a distraction from life for the next 15 seconds. If you don't want to intrude on that space, don't don't, don't get upset because somebody else is doing it, right? Like, Agreed. Yeah, hey, good good for them. 100%. This came to light because Barstool Sports fist pumped Tiger Woods. That was part of it. Yeah, I think that was the straw that kind of yeah, broke the Yeah, but who cares? Back. Like, Tiger Woods goes around. I'll be honest. I wait, saw wait, 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 wait. All Americans go, woo! Like if you go that if you do that in England, you're like, excuse me, sir, you need to get off the uh, the the uh, course. It's too distracting. I mean, look, I can understand when I saw the guys from Barstool do it on Twitter. I'm like, I mean, it's kind of lame, right? Like, but then again, I found it cool. It, so people find it cool too, right? I'm I'm a younger generation. I found it cool. I laugh my ass off at Barstool. Like I guarantee, if I was there, so. I'd be like, hell yeah! <laughs> I would just give me a little fist pump. You get caught in between, right? We do the same thing. We're like. We have these tremendous experiences as guys who exist in the golf equipment world, right? We, we've played some nice courses. We've gone to absolutely incredible places, met some incredible people. And it, you're always kind of juggling that fine line. Like what I do is, is sometimes really awesome and I have a great time. And it's just like, how much of that do I, can I really safely share, right? Yeah, well, without feeling like a total douchebag, right? Well, it's it's both ways, right? It's it's credibility, but also it's you want to be authentic, and that's that's what I think is, you know, I'm I'm fine with the barstool thing because I I think Riggs was like that's authentic. It's like holy shit, I just fist bumped Tiger Woods. <laughs> I mean, just like in any other context, I mean, my God, that's awesome. And so why not? Just why yeah. not? I think the bottom line is, you know, if you really want to distill it down to why the conflict happened was that it went from an objective statement around, oh, okay, this is what happened to, I'm going to place a value statement around that, like, hey, I didn't get into this business to go fist bumping Tiger, i.e., I'm going to undercut the validity of how you're going about what you're going about, never mind the fact, here's how many people consume your content. It was this hierarchical, I'm better than you are, or this is real journalism, you're not real journalism, and well, then you start getting into these value statements. Yeah, you know what? And I, I'd be willing to bet that it, at no point in time when, when Barstool was evolving or, or deciding who they were, right, that, that Riggs sat down and said, you know what? I bet I can get into this. If I get into this, I'm going to fist bump Tiger Woods. That's why I want to do this. No, that, that wasn't why anybody does this. It's just one of those cool things that happened. And so enjoy the ride jesus but none of this means anything because it was just some stupid argument on twitter but it is what it <laughs> <Next>. is <laughs> exactly so next up is the 2020 most wanted driver test and the brands that are going to be participating and tony i'll kind of let you take it from here i think this is a my golf spy first right i don't think this has ever happened so this is this is insanity first of all so all things in context right typically we have uh, one, two, sometimes three brands that, that just for whatever reason, right, decide that they don't want to participate and we have to buy their stuff or pretend they, they don't. Well, back up for everybody, right? So how this all starts is we invite brands to participate, correct? Yes. Generally speaking, it's case by case, test by test, article by article, word by word on whether or not a company, brand, or service likes us or is pissed off at us, right? And any type of consumer reports type model, uh, you can expect to it's almost a good thing to have a couple enemies. I mean, if you do your job right, people aren't going to love you in this industry if we do our job yeah, right. Yeah, I, I remember, uh, you know, I won't mention any names, but but one of the guys that used to be in the industry that we had some serious friction with, right, butted heads quite a lot, made it clear he didn't like us, didn't like what we do, 
Uh, and then, you know, after he left his role, we bumped into him at the PGA show, had a nice little chat, and he looked at me. He's like, look, man, if, if you're not pissing somebody off, you're not doing your job. And so, and now that guy emails, that guy emails me on the regular looking for help from us. So yeah, so, no, it's so perceptions. Right. But yeah, so it's going to be a massive driver test this year. I think, what are we like 37 different models, Harry? Plus uh, models? We have, I believe 37, 38 models. Yeah. So this is our biggest test ever. Yeah. Typically we're around 25. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, so much for the industry dying. Right. So here we go. List of brands participating voluntarily in the 2020 My Golf Spy Most Wanted Driver Test. Uh, alphabetically, here we go. Ben Hogan, Callaway, Cleveland, Cobra, Honma, Lynx, Mizuno, Ping, PXG, Shrixon, Sub-70, TaylorMade, Titleist, Torredge, Tommy Armour, Wilson, and Zexio. There you have it. Did Tony say TaylorMade? He did. Might have mentioned it. Might 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 just squeak. Welcome out. back, guys. <laughs> what has that been? Five years? At least Give or take. Five. Yeah. Yeah. So That's good. First year that every single brand, small and large, uh, is participating in the My Goss by driver test. Well, so willingly participated. It took us ten years. Thank you, everyone. It's awesome. I think and, and some stuff we're working on behind the scenes, both you know, we've talked about the the stuff with priority design. We're working with somebody else who you know, we'll, we'll talk about later who, who is going to help us out too, I think, with the, you know, sort of the number crunching aspects of things and, and not only just streamlining uh, what we do behind the scenes, uh, but also helping us find insights that, that we probably haven't found in the past. You know, I feel for, for Harry and the guys in the test facility because it's, it's a massive workload. Just me, right? <laughs> but I'm, I'm certainly probably, yeah, no, not, not probably. I am more excited about this driver test than any other test we've ever done period i'm so. i'm very excited i mean even though i ha i have a lot of work to do ahead of time um in the future but i'm very excited to actually be a part of just this test alone let alone the test down the road well, great thing everything's just kind of coming together right so we grew by another 1.2 million readers in 2019 which means the more golfers are going to have access to this information and this year will be our biggest driver test so biggest year for our driver tests all the brands participating, the most readers ever at My Golf Spy, um, the best data, like I said last week, and we're working on some things we just haven't had the ability to work on uh, ever. And um, so really excited about that. And uh, Harry has got his work cut out for him. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It's one of the ones that you d you want to stay busy because you know you're working to something really exciting. So yeah, this year will be cool. That's why I'm, I'm you know, not freaking out. <laughs> With the 38 drivers that I have to test with 35 testers. Ton of, ton of uh, tests coming up. And obviously, uh, I wish we could say more about it yet, but I'm, I'm fingers crossed. I don't want to jinx it. We're working on something else that is, for me personally, from just a, an overall project standpoint, the thing at my, my golf spot I've been most excited about since we, we really started conceiving of a way to, to ramp up club testing and do it bigger and, and differently. And so... Yeah, you know, yeah, it's hopefully hopefully by when we we come back the beginning of January we'll we'll be able to talk about it cuz I'm super super excited. Well, another thing we're going to be adding this year and we haven't really discussed it at all is uh, a lot of people have been interested in us doing, you know, find it cut it came out, you know, and expose a lot I'm of the You don't want to talk about that? No, no, let's let's there, you just teased it perfectly. Let's leave it at that. Oh, no, that all right, we'll leave it at no. that. We'll leave it at just find it cut it on steroids. So, um Wait, what? I'm in the in, I'm in the same company. I have no idea what you're talking yeah, about. We don't tell Harry. It's a lot better <laughs> if you don't tell Harry. Wait, I don't feel part of the team anymore. I'm going to All right, what's next? So, well, speaking of drivers and 37 drivers being tested, just think about it. Um, 37 to 12. Yeah. Uh, 37, so 38. Nine new drivers got released on the USGA conforming list that are all from one brand. So um, when you hear this, Especially if I would have told you this a couple of years ago, people's pitchforks would have been stabbing me in the eye. Uh, Callaway has released nine drivers on the USJ formulas. This is nine in addition to the, I don't know, handful that were already there. So what are we up to? I think it's like 13, 14, what? 12 to Wait. 14. I, so yeah. let's take it a baker's dozen of Maverick Callaway drivers, right? And you're sitting there going, 
what a 13 drivers by a brand screw them you know what i mean they're gonna screw this whole industry up this doesn't have to do with that so tony like well first of all what did you say when i told you that earlier is it just because they just to see which one will pop on the usga list? no tell them what why they released nine drivers tony Yes, well, some of it, right, is you have version one and version two, which slight variations for the tour that Callaway does every year. Typically, the version one is for you, and the the version two stuff and the tour stuff is for uh, is for tour guys. And and what's really interesting here, right? And we can't we can't dig in too much about the technology of the Maverick yet. But you know, I, I when I saw these nine drivers, I texted Sean Toulon, and I'm like. WTF, man, like, what are you guys doing? And basically it's, they're sort of looking at, at what they can do with the artificial intelligence and, and shaping faces, not only just to fit bodies, but, you know, we, we all have slightly different swings. So conceptually, you may have a, a driver face attached to a body where if you just change the face, one design would work better with a guy, let's say that, that has a positive angle of attack and maybe just a slightly out to in where Oh, wait a sec. Hold on, hold on a sec. So, you know, when we do this for True Golf Fit and everybody says you guys are crazy because you don't know what the hell you're doing. Ah, now golf companies right, are yeah. some products so, like True Golf Fit. Yeah. So you can you can look at potentially every parameter for a swing. Right. And if you if you can feed in data, which is you know what we do with True Golf Fit, the more data you can fit in, the, the better result you can get. And you when you when you apply that to design, specifically driver face design, if I can you know, the, the numbers that I would put into a system are very different than the parameters Harry would put in, obviously. And so <laughs> if you give the computer an opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to both of these guys are going to play a sub zero, for example. But what Harry needs is is this and what Tony needs is that. And you could get wildly different results. And so that that's kind of what they're it sounds like they're doing at the tour level saying, hey, yeah, this this guy or this group of guys fits better, not into just this driver, but this driver body with this face. Ultimately, what people don't understand, I don't think the average golfer, I don't even think the good golfer or great golfer necessarily understands is there's a club that performs better for every type of delivery, right? So how you deliver the club is going to change how an individual model performs based on that club delivery. So how you deliver angle of attack, what is your tempo, what is your swing speed? One driver that finishes first place for Harry swing could finish 27th place for Adam swing, right? So the smarter golf companies get, the better they'll be able to fit more golfers and the artificial intelligence aspect potentially offers them Potential. way, yes, offers <laughs> them way more options to be able to fit a multitude of club delivery types, right? Okay, so how do you correlate that from say, Joe on the street goes in and say, I have a big slice. So that's the thing, right? Yeah. I think they're, they're true golf fit. Just... Yeah, but one yeah. like it's it's I but I can't hit all nine drivers. Say all of, we're all of them yet. were like this is kind of the start of where that starts to evolve, right? Okay. Yeah. So right, you can if you're working with a tour player, right? You say I I can design this for one guy. When you figure, you know, Callaway would be super psyched to sell a quarter million Mavericks this year, right? Um, you you can't flash face two hundred fifty thousand iterations, but you know, right now, essentially, you have, you know, however many drivers will be in the final Maverick line, right? We've seen three on the USGA list. So you could go from from three where you're you're essentially saying, all right, each of these drivers fits a big bucket of golfers. And maybe, you know, as you learn and iterate, you can say, all right, we're going to we're going to make five faces available. And yeah, the, the more you can sort of isolate for your audience, right, and design for a, a narrower audience, you're ultimately going to give that audience better performance. Well, yeah, and it really follows on the heels of what we're seeing, right? Like with Left Dash, you know, we saw a Titleist and, sure. you know, bringing people from the R&D conversation, bringing consumers in earlier to the process and also bringing them, you know, bringing them in a little bit deeper. And it took Titleist a while to figure out how to do that. No doubt if there's an opportunity, Callaway will figure out how to do that. But, um, you know, I think more than anything, it's kind of a proxy for them to build a story too around what AI can do and 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 by all appearances is pretty damn good story you know there, there's a lot of possibility there it's not a it's not a bullshit marketing story like this is no. a real evolution and progression towards something that has potential to be the future of how golf drivers are fit to the individual swing and golfer yeah and we're, we're a long way off from that and we may never get there because again right you realistically one company 
can't go into a meeting with Golf Galaxy and say, hey, guys, yeah, these are the 37 drivers we're offering this year, right? Like no, but if you could 3D print, you know, 10 years into the future and 3D print a face onto a body, then maybe you could. I mean, this is all theoretical, and this could way down the line turn into something, uh, or it could go absolutely nowhere. But it, it's interesting trying to, trying to think of it from that way and really sort of what everybody is ultimately trying to do is, is better – or, or create a product that, that performs better for an individual golfer versus a big group of golfers. But it's it's a good sign. Like, you want people pushing that envelope, right? Yeah. And trying to get better every day. And, you know, Callaway's trying to do that. And you can say what you want. Like, people can cut that AI face off and go, what the hell is this? They don't really know either. But I can tell you one thing. Like, our brains have a particular capacity to them, and computers have another capacity, right? So sometimes you got to let the computer do the work and just trust it. And it obviously worked. It won our driver test last year. But this, this, there was still room for improvement on the AI face. And I think yeah. as they're learning um, through the mishits on the face, they can know where to manually plug into that AI. Well, what if if Tony's a, what if Tony over the last three years, his strike is always heel low, right? Yeah. And they could design a driver that switches everything to maximize his you know so potential. i'm just seeing i'm seeing like the hosel come down where the toe is and the head come back and then he's hitting off That's the sweet the, spot that was called the bass ackwards driver the bass it actually existed it did yeah remember the power pod 2 was kind of like that too <laughs> yeah boom saw it <laughs> all right next up is uh everyone's favorite product from 2019 so we're just going to go around obviously we tested pretty much everything we saw almost everything in the industry uh, this isn't going to be most wanted driven necessarily. It's just really what did you see? What were you a part of? It could be a five year old thing. It could be a training aid. It could be a product, a driver. Um, so we'll start with Harry and put you on the hot seat. What was your favorite mm. product for 2018? Um, I would say the Ventus Black Shaft I knew he for was me. I say that. Made my dispersion come in and my strike is more off the center of the club face, which is a happy Harry. How crazy is it that a shaft can do that? It's. Yeah, it's. It was nuts. It's real. It's real. So, Chris, we're going to go to you next, man. Um, yeah. Other than I, ice cream, McConnell's ooh, ice cream. That's number one. See, I, you, you <laughs> took, I got a top three. That's one, McConnell's ice cream, organic ice cream out of California. The stuff is unbelievable. Item two is uh, the PVC cutter. Uh, that's my favorite product because without the PVC cutter, we don't have find it, cut it. If we don't have find it, cut it, then... You know, think about all the knowledge we've I gained. I can tell you what, Callaway would have loved if we would have never had a PVC <laughs> Oh, cutter. man, that, they got at least 50 million reasons they would have loved mm -hmm. us to not uh, have had a PVC cutter. But Somebody, somebody said um, they should have just paid y'all $10 million to save 40 <laughs> shut y'all up, buy y'all out, and just said, all right, here's $10 million, go away, shut the hell up. But that, That's one of the better ideas we probably heard this year. But in terms of actual equipment um, – my favorite was the uh, the MP20 line from Mizuno for a lot of reasons. Yeah, it tested really well for us, all those kind of things. But the fact they brought back the copper underlay um, was a, a, a huge for two reasons. One, you know, Mizuno is uh, fundamentally a Japanese company, and, and a lot of times some companies are a little bit reticent to take risks. And that was a big risk for them to, to go that route, to do it on a large scale. And it was really based on feedback that was discernible to players, but they couldn't prove it, which is a very different approach for Mizuno. And so the, the, the story of the copper underlay, making it back into the 20 series um, is my personal favorite story around the equipment space. And it does feel good. And it's a cool play back to the TN 87s and, um, you know, for those of us that had the MP29s and MP14s and and all of that, uh, you know, we appreciate kind of the nostalgia around that too. I like that one. I think the uh, PVC cutter is the best one. I think. I think <laughs> yeah. That's it. PVC or, or HMB? I mean, it's yeah, <laughs> one or the Home, other. Home Depot did call and say thank you for that. We really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no, a, a yeah run, right. Unreal. What do you th What do you got, Tony? What's your favorite product of 2019? Well, I mean, I, I think we know I'm I'm a big Ventus fan, and um, you know, Copycat. a few weeks from now, a few weeks from now, I'm going to be venting in a little bit different way about the Ventus, but but we'll we'll hold on to that. Um, wow, a lot so, of teasers, a lot of teasers. Uh, so um, yeah, I guess with with Ventus off the table, uh, a few things like I was I kind of 
gravitated, I guess, towards the Titleist lineup in general this year. So, I, Star I, Wars. I played, yeah, I, well, I played TS3 all year, and I, I really, really was impressed with the with the T200. So that that for me is kind of like a, a sleeper product that I really, really like. And that's okay. it's, it's almost difficult to admit that to myself, really. I'm it's surprised, been... like you weren't going to say Puma. Puma. <laughs> well, now he's je- now he's he can't be sponsored I just by threw him a again. watermelon. I don't know if he's going to try to hit it or what, but uh, no, Puma. I'm not not, gonna, I'm not, <laughs> not gonna Puma. 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 I do have my. my, my uh, there we go. He's promoting. Is, he's promoting. But... He's back on it. What's it? What is this called? I can't even remember. Meow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it has a flying cat. Hold on. Oh, God, here it's we like go. The, he's actually going to go to the script. That he's, <laughs> he's, he's getting, he's getting the script out. What is this? I got the tag. I can't so it's, read it's, it that far away. On the ground. This is, this is the, the cloud Milia? spun. Cloud spun. Believe it or is not, that? Tony is not sponsored by Puma. but Puma or Puma. It, <laughs> or Puma. But you'd be hard-pressed to convince Harry of that. Oh, I, that. I, just, I just, I love it. It's just, and it, it you know, they... So this they they say generous through the chest and shoulders, right? That's that's how they describe this cut. And mm-hmm. as it is bulking season, uh, I do need a little more of a generous cut these days. So. <laughs> just just all you need to do is just go down in the sides and bam, you're there. Mm. <laughs> Your bulking season is there. You're there. <laughs> medium, medium. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't. What's think yours, I have, Adam? What's your one? I have a few different ones, and they're selfish, I guess, towards my gospel. Um, but. I would say I really am glad that we did no putts given. That, sir, is not a product. This is not a yeah, product. Yeah, it's tough to call it a product, I guess. But it is something that we've talked about for a long time, and we obviously have a – it's hard because we're so datacratic, right, which we obviously also have opinions. We know that the data is the data, and we want to publish that for everybody. But we also have an opinion that we've wanted to get across, and that's been tough because – we don't want that to influence people to think that just because we have this opinion, that's going to influence what our data is. Right. And it doesn't obviously, but, um, it's, there's too much data. It can't, we just have to let the computers yeah. <laughs> figure it out. Yeah. But this has given us an outlet to really kind of, you know, say our opinion on everything we have. And, you know, as I think the name kind of fits it well, uh, no putts given. And the other one, I think is our staff. Like I know there, I'm sure there are people that, you know, golf digest and all those places that have hardworking people. We haven't built this staff around the most, you know, not, we're not looking at me for saying smart. No, I was not looking at you. Exactly. I can see it in the side of your eye. We did not build this around (laughs) the most impressive resumes. Right. So I love passion and I love people that really just, you know, Tony loves what he does every single day. He might hate it. He might tell you that, but Tony loves what he does. Some days. Some days. Yeah. And uh, he's super dedicated to what he does. And I don't think people even can wrap their head around all the work that goes in behind the scenes to producing what we do with the small staff that we have. But um, every day we go to work to, with one phrase and that's do it right. You know, and we don't publish a lot of stuff that's just not good enough. And, um, we're not going to ever be a site that has 52 articles a day, and I don't want it to be that way, and we're different for a reason, and while we're not new school or old school, we're just our own school, you know? Shmedia. And if you like us, great, and if you don't, I don't really give a shit, and we're going to keep doing what we do, and um, that's the staff that we have all kind of has that mentality, right? And that's our down to our DNA. That's why Chris works so well. Um, Nickel is fairly new uh, full-timer at my golf spy and he fits in perfectly and harry as well harry's a hard-working all-american golfer tony and uh so and everybody i love all the people that work for my golf spy and i'm super proud of the product that we put out so yep so that's my favorite product Our, my favorite product is the product we put out and i'm proud of the product that we put out and i'm proud of the people that work uh, with my golf spy and um 10 years in doing this it has been an uphill climb, but I sure have a, uh, appreciated every bit of effort that all the guys put in and all the ladies put in for my golf spy. So, uh, we only have one last topic and it's really not that interesting to me. It's a $250 putter shaft that is really hard for me to talk about, but at the end of the day, it did come out this week. It's called the stability tour putter shaft. And Tony, I mean, 
I guess this came to be because greens used to be slow, right? They got faster from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. And for that reason, putter heads kind of had to get a little heavier. Um, yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there there's was, a whole evolutionary story to it. But at the end of the day, right, yeah, putter heads have gotten heavier. Putter shafts haven't really changed because, you know. Why is the, that? Uh, well, Price. Because they're, yeah, they're, they're cheap Bingo. the way they are. And, you know, most golfers have putted just fine or well enough with them but the whole idea is hey if we can if we can make a a shaft that is fundamentally stiffer and this is you know this it's kind of the same story behind the original stability shaft the fundamentally stiffer shaft is the same thing that that odyssey is talking about with stroke lab and the idea is like you know it just it just doesn't twist and it doesn't bend and it doesn't deflect so as much it does what you need it to do and the big difference between the the tour shaft and the original is, is just that the new one is lighter so that it feels more like a conventional putter shaft. So your swing weights are going to be in within something close to the expected range. Whereas with the, uh, the first iteration of Barney Adams stability shaft, you could get into, you know, E five with a putter, which is for those of you who aren't familiar with, uh, uh, what that feels like or, or what that means. Imagine kind of putting with like something more akin to a sledgehammer. So Chris, let me ask you a question. Like you take this, here's the options for golfers right now, right? You got a steel putter shaft, which like Tony said, has worked fairly well for Tiger Woods, right? And you've got the, you know, the new shaft, the stroke lab shaft from Odyssey. And then you've got this $250 shaft, right? That is supposedly uh, supposed to improve your putting. So those are your three options. Why in the hell would I ever pay $250 for a putter shaft for a product that almost no golfers go into the store thinking, man, what's the upgraded shaft I can buy for that? You want it. Um, and that's the problem, you know, is that it's, I think <clears throat> there's a segment that will because they'll, they'll believe anything and they're willing to pay whatever amount, you know, a certain way to rationalize it. Hey, if I make one more putt every four rounds, I'll pay this putter shaft off in a thousand rounds. And geez, I pay, you know, whatever. They, they'll figure out a way to do that. But what I like about this product, and and quite frankly, I like about the price point, is that it's getting people's attention. And and what it's doing by doing that is shifting the conversation around. Is this something that we're going to see more of? Um, you know, in a way, Odyssey did a really smart thing with any of their new putter heads. Even for a lot of the guys on tour, they wouldn't put in the old shaft. They made you know everything. It was a package deal. You had to have um, you know their particular proprietary shaft in there, and so it's getting a lot of exposure, then they can say, you know, X amount are, are out in the market, but it's shifting that conversation and people notice a $250 shaft. They'll pay attention to the topic where it's like, Hey, you know, this is a $19 shaft or, you know, like KBS has the CT. That's what, like 19, 29 bucks, something like that. That just doesn't garner the same uh, amount of attention. But why would a rational person go spend $250 on a shaft to put in a putter that they maybe spent a hundred dollars on, hundred twenty dollars on. Uh, I I don't know. I think it's a non-starter there. I think that's where the sales. Uh, I don't know that the sales happen at that price point at two fifty. Um, it's you know it's uh, yeah like I said the price is a non-starter for me. Well, what's the difference between the Callaway and this two hundred and fifty? The Callaway shaft. one is included for free. With right, the but is so. All right, so <laughs> is it the same technology? Is it what? What is different about them? It's it's similar. So the the big difference between you know, and they tell a little bit different stories, but the big difference between the original stability shaft and and Callaway Stroke Lab was the weight, and so now the the stability tour is closer to the the Stroke Lab in weight. It looks like, but but here's what I would say. So you're like, hey, you know, why would anybody pay X for a graphite putter shaft when steel has worked fine forever, right? Well, that was that was the same argument with with a driver. And, and a fairway wood and it's it's the same sort of discussion that's being had now as, as companies are fighting to to make graphite iron shafts more popular right you're, you're going to talk up benefits and and fundamentally the argument is the same look if the over time the driver head evolved right it got bigger it got heavier and so you needed a fundamentally different shaft to to maximize your performance and that that's kind of the argument for whether it's stability shaft or stroke lab or you know anything in that sort of lighter stiffer kind of discussion is like hey yeah if you look at look at the trends over the years putter heads have gotten heavier too and while you're not putting the same force on your putting stroke as you are with a with a driver swing it absolutely does matter it does have an impact and so 
custom fitters are going to love this because, you know, there is the opportunity to to upsell a product if they are hopefully right. You, you hope that your fitter has the integrity to only sh- sell something that can show demonstrable improvement. Um, <laughs> but it's an opportunity there. right? Uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> well, and I think that's it. I think if and when you compare the story with actual data, it's like saying, you know, different graphite shafts with different driver heads. Um, you know, you could show somebody, hey, here's why this is going to perform a lot better for you. Um, you know, at least in the first test that we ran with with this particular putter shaft, it was kind of a mixed bag, better for some, not better for all. Yeah, and I think I think I'd be interested to test the new one along the same lines because again, what what we ended up in that original test was a pretty big swath between the the swing weight of the the steel shafted putter and the swing weight of this the stability shaft because again it was significantly heavier here we're closing that gap and so what you're going to get is a putter that a putter shaft that feels closer to what you're used to in the stroke but theoretically offers all the benefits that are promised here. That's so a good point. It's, it's a curiosity for sure. That's yeah, a good point. One to here's test, a, yeah. Here's the two things I like about it. One is um, if I were in the golf club design business, right, I would come into a meeting, get everybody in and go, all right, what are our opportunities, right? Where are the opportunities in golf? And you look around driver heads and putters and all this stuff, and then there's this steel shaft, and you go, hmm, nothing's been done with that pretty much ever, right? So there's an opportunity there to create a differentiator, Okay. And it was kind of when, if you go back to the rocket balls thing, when TaylorMade was around, they looked around and went, dude, we kind of own this world, right? Where else can we grab some market share? And they looked at this fairway wood and went, no one gives a shit about fairway wood. We can put the same tech in the fairway wood and jump this thing, oh, by the way, 17 yards and grab some attention. Um, that was an opportunity and a differentiator. So I like that aspect of it, that Callaway is looking at things to go, where can we improve things for golfers that other people aren't looking at? And two the steel putter shaft was only there because it didn't cost money. Right. So it was just stuck in there because it was $2. Um, that shouldn't stop you from trying other things. And like you said, Chris, the $250 shaft probably will never live on forever. I know it actually won't like, that's not going to be a viable product forever, but what it will do is draw attention to that category and that product in that area of the putter and what it's doing is already doing what Odyssey is doing, right? They're including those for free. So more people are getting those in their hands. And if what that's going to do is just continue to evolve things no different than the nine Callaway drivers and the purpose behind why they created those, the end result 10 years is if you don't know, you don't know, right? And the only way you can know is by starting out by doing something and figuring shit out, right? So I like that they're they're tinkering and things are going to be figured out because of this. And ultimately that's going to end up helping golfers, I think. So yeah, and it, it's, it's not going to stay at 250 forever, right? Like you said, if, if, if shaft companies, right, if graphite shaft companies, Fujikura, you know, matrix back, they've, they've had something right. UST has something already. Shaft companies are going to look at the landscape and see if there's a viable opportunity there. Yep. And these guys, you know, Fujikura, right. Certainly has, uh, greater manufacturing capacity and buying power than breakthrough golf technology the maker stability shaft does and when when you're looking at, at what something like this actually costs or should cost there's no for a putter shaft right you don't you don't need t1100 or pitch 70 or all of these exotic fibers that are all the rage in driver shafts right you, you don't need, probably need 40 ton you can use kind of your your basic graphite fiber and just you know, make it stiff and it's going to deliver the performance that these, you know, sort of premium exotic new shaft offerings are, can, are promising. And they're going to do it for, you know, pennies on the dollar. I could see, you know, I, I think a hundred dollar price point is probably not I in mean, the distant I c- future. I can hear, I can hear golfers on the, uh, in the cars, listen to this saying, Oh, I don't know. I just put like a triple X shaft in there and then call it a day. Like well, Ace, obviously Ace I know from fried eggs is definitely gonna have the triple. Oh yeah, step. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying, like obviously a, a regular steel, like a steel shaft is gonna flex more on longer parts and and that, and the uh, stability shaft doesn't allow that to happen, and you can save weight um, in the in that stability shaft and put it elsewhere in the putter. But I guarantee there's gonna be someone that comes out with just a regular golf shaft and make it an extra extra stiff or whatever. And call it good and get it quite close to the stability shaft. Well, you're gonna you're gonna 
dump a lot of to do that with steel though right this is this is fundamentally a weight a weight saving story and so if you're going to do this with steel you're going to add weight so yes it, it could be done with steel right? even if you shave it down to like a really really thin part at the end and then there's the weight you've saved it there's Boom. zero benefit that i can see from your starting point going hey we're going to start with steel let's innovate steel there are so many other opportunities if weight is the object of needing to improve that that is low down on the totem pole for what material yeah. you should be using right i think what's going to happen is you'll see companies develop the technologies like odyssey did partner with an oem just like we see with other shafts get their product in there in there maybe they bump it up 20 30 40 dollars but then there's a tech store to tell around that price increase and it's a it's a win-win it's an easy one if you look at kind of where the market is headed if you're you're tailor-made right who we've seen makes a, a quality putter right they I would assume at some point they're going to look at this and go, yeah, we, we should do that. And maybe even Scotty Cameron, which is traditionally resistant to doing anything differently, may look at it and go, yeah, at least let, let's have this as an option. Every time he does something different, he gets slapped in the face, which I hate. You know, like he has he just keeps going back and doing refinishing colors on what sells. Right. Which makes sense from a sales standpoint. But the Scotty Cameron, I think, would love to push the envelope a little bit with stuff like that. But. His client looks at a four hundred and fifty dollar milled putter and goes, Don't give me a damn gadget. Give me a milled putter, you know? And that's that's paints him in a tough corner to really innovate. Twenty bucks is is a different value to me than it is to you. It's all relevant. Now when it so when it comes to um, that stability shaft for two hundred and fifty bucks, I I don't think this anyone else apart from a serious golfer is gonna buy that shaft. Bob Parsons doesn't care about that two hundred and fifty dollars. But if you give it for free, I think Callaway is great for that because I, I think, totally agree. boom, you get you get maybe not as good of a product as 250, but you're going to get damn close to it. I think Callaway Odyssey was, I think it was really smart. smart. Yeah, no, I agree. I think they're really smart because I think that's that's one of the ones that, all right, if you can tell that story and tell them and show graphics of how it can improve your putting from six foot to 25, 30 foot. And I bet they love that the stability shafts out there for two hundred fifty dollars. Because they're like, yeah, go out there, you know, market for us. Because we're oh, by the way, they're free over here. You know, yeah, exactly. I think, I think that's, I think they were smart to do that. All right, well, that's the end of the show. But before we go, I'm going to go around and ask you right now, who's going to win the 2020 Most Wanted Driver Test? Chris, what do you got? I think the winner of the 2020 Most Wanted Driver Test is going to be. Uh, can we say the product name? Taylor Made's driver they have coming out. Can we say the name of it actually? No, no. we cannot. I do believe that Taylor Made's 2020 driver option will be the most wanted winner. Mm, interesting. All right, Tony, what you got? 2020 um, most wanted driver winner. Maverick. I hate myself, but yeah. Wait, he gone he gone away from Taylor Made? Uh, oh. No, he said no no no. He said Taylor Made would be the number one selling driver. Oh, selling driver. Which one of the nine? <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Like, we're, we're, with nine in the mix, by one got, down yeah, no. yeah, I didn't factor that into my decision. Well, Tony has now sold out to the two biggest brands in golf. <laughs> Taylor made for the number one selling driver and Callaway for the number one performer. What you got? I know what you're going just, with. Just by seeing the uh, just the few swings that we've, we've recorded. You've got a little advantage. I do. I've seen a jump up in one or two miles on our ball speed with the Maverick, with all testers out there. Whether the dispersion is different, a uh, ball speed is definitely up. Whew. I just have, yeah. All right, well, I'm going to go, I'm gonna go with the old statement, the best predictor of the future is the past, right? And in the past, it's been a couple brands and a couple brands only, really, and that is Cobra, Callaway, and TaylorMade. So I'm going to say it's going to be those three in a tie, okay? No ping. <laughs> <laughs> we good? Well, ping won <laughs> once, but uh, no, I, th I think it'll be Callaway. I think it's going to be the Maverick. So that's it. Yeah. yeah, I mean. All right. All right, so that's our last episode of No Putts Given for the holidays. Uh, this will be the last one before we come back on January 2nd. Everybody from My Goss Spy. going to be some articles out there you can still check out on My Goss Spy, but this will be the last episode of No Putts Given. So hope everyone has a happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate. And um, that's it. We out. We out. We out.